Hi everyone, welcome to Psychic Creations. This show is what I term a listening program, as it is a fun narration rather than a lot of photos or a video. Please enjoy. The holidays are a wonderful time of year, and being I am an author of now 26 books with more on the way, yay, I thought, what better way to celebrate this December by speaking on favorite Christmas books and stories. A Christmas Carol, written by Charles Dickens in 1843. Short on time and obligated to produce a piece for his editor, Dickens wrote this story using many details from his own life. In the story, he tells the tale of an old bitter man named Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is visited by three ghosts who take him on a journey through Christmas's past, present, and future. Letters from Father Christmas by J.R.R. R. Tolkien Every December, J.R.R. R. Tolkien's children would receive a letter from Father Christmas. These letters shared Father Christmas's experiences that year, from an accident-prone polar bear to a goblin war in caves beneath the house, and are riddled with life's lessons. In Letters from Father Christmas. Tolkien had compiled all of these short stories into one book for you to enjoy with your children. One letter from Santa Claus is quoted as this. I hope you will like the little things I have sent you. You seem to be most interested in railways just now, so I am sending you mostly things of that sort. I send as much love as ever. In fact, more. We both, the old polar bear and I, enjoyed having so many nice letters from you and your pets. So, my dears, I hope you will be happy this Christmas and not quarrel and will have some good games with your railway all together. Don't forget Old Father Christmas when you light your tree. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry Gift of the Magi is a beautiful story about the personal sacrifices we are willing to make for the ones that we love. A quote in the book is as such. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the newborn child. They were the first to give Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were doubtless wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two children who each sold the most valuable thing he and she owned in order to buy a gift for the other. Everywhere there are wise ones. They are the Magi. The Nutcracker and the Mouse King is a novel written in 1816 by German author E. T. A. Hoffman. A quote from the book is as such. Kind reader or listener, whatever may be your name, whether Frank, Robert, Henry, Anna, or Maria, I beg you to call to mind the table covered with your last Christmas gifts. As in their newest gloss, they first appear to be your delighted vision. You will then be able to imagine the astonishment of the children as they stood with sparkling eyes, unable to utter a word for joy at the sight before them. The Elves and the Shoemaker by Jacob Grimm and Wilhelm Grimm. The Elves and the Shoemaker is a classic fairy tale by the Grimm brothers. One morning, a shoemaker comes into his shop to find a beautiful pair of shoes has been made for him to sell. Astonished, he determines to find out who he should thank for the service. And a quote from the book goes as such. 
As soon as it was midnight, there came in two little dwarfs, and they sat themselves upon the shoemaker's bench, took up all the work that was cut out, and began to ply with their little fingers, stitching and wrapping and tapping away at such a rate that the shoemaker was all wonder and could not take his eyes off them. On they went till the job was quite done and the shoes stood ready for use upon the table. The Steadfast Tin Soldier by Hans Christian Andersen In The Steadfast Tin Soldier, Hans Christian Andersen tells the tale of a tin soldier's many adventures. And a quote from the book goes as such. There were once five and twenty tin soldiers. They were all brothers born of the same old tin spoon. They shouldered their muskets and looked straight ahead of them, splendid in their uniforms, all red and blue. All the soldiers looked exactly alike, except one. He looked a little different, as he had been cast last of all. The tin was short, so he had only one leg. But there he stood, as steady on one leg as any of the other soldiers on there too. But you'll see, he'll be the remarkable one. "'Twas the Night Before Christmas by Clement Clark Moore. Although commonly referred to as "'Twas the Night Before Christmas," this children's Christmas poem is actually titled A Visit from St. Nicholas. "'Twas the Night Before Christmas was actually its first line. "'Twas the Night Before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring. Not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The poem was first published anonymously in 1823 and later attributed to Clement Clark Moore, who did claim authorship in 1837. Like many of you, I'm sure reading this on Christmas Eve is a family tradition. The Fir Tree by Hans Christian Andersen The Fir Tree is a fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. It tells the story of a young tree that wants nothing more than to grow up. In focusing so much on the future, the tree forgets to truly appreciate the present. And a quote from the book goes as such. Rejoice in thy youth, said the sunbeam. Rejoice in thy fresh growth and in the young life that is in thee. Two years after publishing Wonderful World of Oz, Frank Baum wrote this story about the life of Santa Claus. Baum follows Santa as he learns to make toys, picks out his reindeer, and visits every child in one night. A quote from the book goes as such. It is possible for any man by good deeds to enshrine himself as a saint in the hearts of people. Christmas Trees by Robert Frost Christmas Trees is a poem by Robert Frost that encapsulates the wisdom of a Vermont farmer and the beauty of his country. And a quote from the book goes, He proved to be the city come again to look for something it had left behind and could not do without and keep its Christmas. He asked if I would sell my Christmas trees, my woods, the young firm balsams, like a place where houses are all churches and have spires. I haven't thought of them as Christmas trees. I doubt if I was tempted for a moment to sell them off their feet to go in cars and leave the slope behind the house all bare, where the sun shines now no warmer than the moon. 
Christmas Day in the Morning by Pearl S. Buck. A boy surprises his father by getting up very early in the morning to take care of the work on the farm. This is a cute short story about love and family. And a quote from the book goes as such. Ah, oh, that was a true joy of life, the ability to love. Love was still alive in him. It still was. It occurred to him suddenly that it was alive because long ago it had been born in him when he knew his father loved him. That was it. Love alone could awaken love, and he could give the gift again and again. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose, and if you ever saw him, you would even say it glows. Robert L. May wrote Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer at the request of the department store company, Montgomery Ward. The story was given out for free to over two million children who visited the stores during Christmas time of 1939. Robert's brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, saw the popularity of the story and wrote the song we all know and love. From there, the story took off, and we now can't even imagine Christmas with our best bud, Rudolph. How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Zeus. How the Grinch Stole Christmas is a children's story that, even as adults, we enjoy reading every year. Dr. Zeus is great at sneaking deep life lessons into his stories, and in this tale, he demonstrates that Christmas is a spiritual experience, not a material one. And a quote from the book goes as such. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? The Cricket on the Hearth by Charles Dickens this is the third book in Charles Dickens' series of five Christmas novels. The story is about a cricket who serves as a guardian angel to a young family. A quote from the book goes as such. Caleb was no sorcerer, but in the only magic art that still remains to us, the magic of devoted, deathless love, nature had been the mistress of his study, and from her teaching, all wonder came. The Snowman by Raymond Briggs This is another one of those books that we read every Christmas when we were little. A little boy makes a snowman and it magically comes to life. Then the snowman takes the boy on a great adventure to the North Pole. And a quote from that book goes as such. I remember that winter because it had brought the heaviest snows I had ever seen. Snow had fallen steadily all night long, and in the morning I woke in a room filled with light and silence, and the whole world seemed to be held in a dreamlike stillness. It was a magical day, and it was on that day I made the snowman. The Polar Express by Chris Van Alsberg. In the middle of the night, a young boy is woken by a train pulling up outside his house. The train is full of children and it takes him to the North Pole where he gets to meet Santa Claus. A quote from the book goes as such. Seeing is believing, but sometimes the most real things in the world are the things that we can't see. Published in 1985, Chris Van Alsberg is also the illustrator of this book. The movie, The Polar Express, 
is a 2004 American computer animated film based on the book. Written, produced, and directed by Robert Zemeckis, the film features human characters animated using the live action performance capture technique. The Best Christmas Pageant Ever by Barbara Robinson. This is a hilarious Christmas story about the Herdman children learn the Christmas story in their own, well, unique way. If you are looking for some laughs, definitely give this one a read. A quote from the book goes as such. The Herdmans were absolutely the worst kids in the history of the world. They lied, they stole, and smoked cigars, even the girls did, and talked dirty and hit little kids and cussed their teachers and took the name of the Lord in vain and set fire to Fred Shoemaker's old broken down tool house. Amazing Peace by Maya Angelou. In this deeply inspiring poem, Maya Angelou calls on us to embrace one another despite differing beliefs, seek peace, and enjoy life. A quote from the book goes as such. Angels and mortals, believers and non-believers, look heavenward and speak the word aloud. Peace. A Letter from Santa Claus In 1875, Mark Twain wrote a letter to his daughter, Susie, who was three years old at the time, which he signed, Your Loving Santa Claus. Twain was very close to his daughter, all the way up to her untimely death at the age of 24 in 1896. That year, 1875, Susie had written her first letter to Santa Claus. Twain, being a writer, couldn't stand for his young daughter to feel like her work went unheard, so he decided to pen the following letter to My Dear Susie Clemens, from the man in the moon himself. The story has been widely shared since in anthologies as a cute reminder of the spirit of Christmas and the love of parents for their children, who year after year don bright red suits and leave out milk and cookies to help keep the magic alive. And here is the letter. Palace of St. Nicholas, in the moon, Christmas morning. My dear Susie Clemens, I have received and read all the letters which you and your little sister have written me by the hand of your mother and your nurses. I have also read those which you little people have written me with your own hands. For although you did not use any characters that are in the grown-up people's alphabet, you used all the characters that all children in all lands on earth and in the twinkling stars use. And as all my subjects in the moon are children and use no character but that, you will easily understand that I can read your baby sister's jagged and fantastic marks without any trouble at all. But I had trouble with those letters which you dictated through your mother and the nurses, for I am a foreigner and cannot read English writing well. You will find that I made no mistakes about the things which you and your baby ordered in your own letters. I went down your chimney at midnight when you were asleep and delivered them all myself and kissed both of you, too, because you are good children, well-trained, nice-mannered, and about the most obedient little people I have ever saw. But in the letter which you dictated, there were some words which I could not make out for certain, and one or two small orders which I could not feel because we ran out of stock. Our last lot of kitchen furniture for dolls has just gone to a very poor little girl in the North Star, away up in the cold country above the Big Dipper. 
Your mama can show you that star, and you will say, Little Snowflake, for that is what the child's name is. I'm glad you got that furniture, for you need it more than I. That is, you must write that with your own hand, and Snowflake will write you an answer. If you only spoke it, she wouldn't hear you. Make your letter light and thin, for the distance is great and the postage is heavy. There was a word or two in your mama's letter, which I couldn't be certain of. I took it to be a trunk full of doll's clothes. Is that it? I will call at your kitchen door about nine o'clock this morning to inquire. But I must not see anybody, and I must not speak to anybody but you. When the kitchen doorbell rings, George must be blindfolded and sent to open the door. Then he must go back to the dining room or the china closet and take the cook with him. Then you must go up to the nursery and stand on a chair or the nurse's bed and put your car to the speaking tube that leads down to the kitchen. And when I whistle through it, you must speak in the tube and say, Welcome, Santa Claus. Then I will ask whether it was a trunk you ordered or not. If you say it was, I shall ask you what color you want the trunk to be. Your mama will help you name a nice color, and then you must tell me every single thing in detail which you want that trunk to contain. Then, when I say goodbye and a Merry Christmas to my little Susie Clemens, you must say, Goodbye, good old Santa Claus. I thank you very much. And please tell little Snowflake I will look at her star tonight, and she must look down here. I will be right in the West Bay window, and every fine night I will look at her star and say, I know somebody up there, and I like her too. Then you must go down into the library and make George close all the doors that open into the main hall. And everybody must keep still for a little while. I will go to the moon and get those things. And in a few minutes, I will come down the chimney that belongs to the fireplace that is in the hall. If it is a trunk you want because I couldn't get such a thing as a trunk down the nursery chimney, as you know. People may talk if they want, until they hear my footsteps in the hall. Then you tell them to keep quiet a little while till I go back up the chimney. Maybe you will not hear my footsteps at all, so you may go now and then and peep through the dining room doors and by and by, you will see that thing which you want right under the piano in the drawing room, for I shall put it there. If I should leave any snow in the hall, you must tell George to sweep it into the fireplace, for I haven't had time to do such things. George must not use a broom, but a rag. You must watch George and not let him run into danger. If my boot should leave a stain on the marble, George must not holly stone it away. Leave it there, always in memory of my visit. And whenever you look at it or show it to anybody, you must let it remind you to be a good little girl. Goodbye for a few minutes till I come down to the world and ring the kitchen doorbell. Your loving Santa Claus whom people sometimes call the man in the moon. Ghostly, ta Ghostly Tales for Christmas Eve Gathering around a fire to share ghost stories was actually a beloved Christmas tradition in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Frigid temperatures and long nights were considered the best condition to share grim stories. 
Nothing satisfies us on Christmas Eve but to hear each other tell authentic anecdotes about specters, wrote British travel writer and humorist Jerome K. Jerome in the introduction of his 1891 anthology of Christmas stories titled Told After Supper. Do you have a story to tell on your Christmas Eve? Here is my very, very scary, ghostly tale for Christmas Eve. It is called Scared at a Seance. When I was a girl, I joined a young teen affiliation. We raised money for the community, read stories to the elderly, tutored elementary children, and other quote-unquote good deed related activities. One year at Halloween, our organization rented a hall for this season's festivities. The building was very old, completed in 1876. The inside doors were massive, sliding, carved oak panels. The ceilings were high, which yielded echoing acoustics. There were numerous narrow yet tall windows that allowed any wind to whistle in, and the floors were polished hardwood that creaked with each footfall. It was the perfect place for a Halloween party. After the night celebration, the girls in the club were allowed to sleep over in this building. So we unrolled our sleeping bags, plumped our pillows, had our snacks and sodas waiting at our elbows, and we set about telling ghost stories. This, then, set the scene for one of the girls to suggest we have a seance. I felt very uncomfortable with this idea, but the other girls excitedly agreed to this scary ceremony. Most of them giggled nervously as we sat down, forming a huge circle, and clasped our hands. I wanted to go downstairs and sit with the chaperones, to be honest. The one girl who suggested having a seance conducted the session. We listened in anticipation. I have a, there is a slight wind whistling through the drafty windows, and the roof was creaking in the breeze also. After a few minutes, two of the massive carved doors leading into a waiting room slowly started rolling open. At first, most of the girls didn't notice it, but I did, and I was paralyzed with fear. Shortly, all the kids heard the doors opening, and seeing no one gliding the widening expanse, their screams alerted the matrons, who came running. Needless to say, I didn't get a wink of sleep that night, along with most of the other girls who were too scared to close their eyes. To this day, I do not know who or what opened those doors, but I've never gone back into that building after that night. When I drive past that building, even today, I still shudder at what happened that Halloween night.